The Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke is a home for faculty, students, and staff who are dedicated to understanding the moral challenges of our time. The Purpose Project at Duke is an interdisciplinary and multi-school project funded by the Duke Endowment that seeks to make matters of meaning, purpose, and character signature features of the Duke experience. So in our session tonight, you'll hear more about one of these topics that we would consider in the Keenan Institute and the Purpose Project from my colleagues. My, the colleague immediately to my right here is Walter Sinnott Armstrong, the Chauncey Stillman Professor of Practical Ethics in the Trinity College of Arts and Sciences. To both of our right is Tamar Kushner, Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience in Trinity College of Arts and Sciences. And to the right of all three of us is Henry Petrosky, the Alexander S. Hefesik Distinguished Professor Emeritus in the Pratt School of Engineering. So as you just heard, we have an in-person and a virtual audience today. We'll invite questions from everyone at the conclusion of the final presentation when we move to the Q&A portion of our program. So we will expect you to have questions at the final portion of our program. So now, please welcome to each of our speakers. And Walter, let's begin with your answer to what is free will. I'm Walter Senator Armstrong, and I thank you all for coming and for forever learning, right? And so uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this big question. It really is a big question, and I'm just going to give you the briefest, roughest initial introduction to what some philosophers uh, think about this issue. And the way I teach it in classes when I'm trying to uh, teach Duke students is I start with examples. So let's start with an example here. Uh, imagine that there's a universe which everything that happens is completely caused by whatever happened before it. Might not be ours, but some universe where this is true. So from the very beginning, first thing causes the next, causes the next, causes the next, so on up to the present. For example, one day John has french fries with this lunch, and that is completely caused by what happened before it. So, if everything in this universe was exactly the same, before John decided to have french fries, it had to happen that he would decide to have french fries. So, in this universe, does anyone ever act of their own free will? I, I want to show a hand, so you got to participate. How many people think, in fact, in this universe, some people sometimes act of their own free will? And how many people think nobody in this universe acts of their own free will? Okay, so as in most surveys, the majority say no. Now let's change it just a little bit. Same universe. Everything that happens is completely caused. But in this universe, a man named Bill has become sexually attracted to his secretary. So he decides that the only way to be with her is to kill his wife and three children. So he knows it's impossible to escape from his house in the event of a fire. So he, before he leaves on a trip, he sets up a device that burns down the house and kills his family. Now... How many people think that Bill killed his wife and children of his own free will? How many people think he did not kill his wife and children of his own free will? I mean, he killed them, but not of his own free will. So they are the majority. A lot of you didn't raise your hand. because you, uh, But what happens is usually the majority says nobody's free in that universe. But then the majority says, but Bill is. And what I'm going to try to do is to show you how you can have it both ways because you're talking about two different kinds of freedom. And to make it clear uh, what those kinds are, let's go back to the original argument that kind of spurs this all on. Every act is either determined or random, kind of like the universe that we talked about, but you got to allow for quantum mechanics, so it might be random. There might be some subatomic particle that jumps to energy levels you know, that you're not aware of. So, But then any agent whose act is determined is not free. That was the thought behind people who said that John was not free when he ordered french fries, okay? But if it's random, it's not free either. You know, if, if some subatomic particle in my brain jumps a and my hand goes out, then I didn't move my hand freely. That wasn't me moving it. I didn't choose. It was, you know, an effect of that subatomic particle. So if everything's either one or the other and neither one's free, then no agent's ever free. 
But if you're not free, you're not responsible. So if the electron goes off and my arm goes out and it hits Tamar in the face, I'm sorry, but I'm not responsible, right? Because I wasn't free. And so if no agent's ever free, then no agent is ever responsible. But if no agent is ever res is responsible, oh, well, an, an agent who's not responsible should not be punished. That's the point of a trial. You got to find out who's responsible for the crime. And you you find and if they're responsible, you find them guilty and you punish them. And if they're not, you you should let them go, right? And and if you make a mistake and you punish somebody who should not have been punished, then you ought to apologize to them. You might even owe them compensation for what happened to them, but at least you deserve an apology. So every murderer, including Bill, who has ever been punished, is owed an apology and maybe some compensation. The reason I have the word no there is I hope nobody wants to reach that conclusion. The problem is that how do you avoid it? Because if the first eight are true, the ninth one has to be true. So you have to deny something along the way. And there are a number of different responses. Incompatibilists say freedom and determinism are incompatible. If it's determined, it's not free. So premise two is true. This is just to remind you what premise two is. They go, yeah. Now, if you want to avoid getting to conclusion nine and you accept premise two, you have to deny something else. And different incompatibilists deny different ones. We can talk about them later. There are different theories. But you can see there are a lot of options for them to deny it. But none of them is really all that attractive. They've all got some problems, some costs. So compatibilists say, well, an act can be both determined and also free. Determinism is compatible with free will and freedom of action. So premise two is false, according to compatibilists. Okay? So you've got these two theories. Which one is correct? What I want to say is both of them are correct. But they're talking about different kinds of freedom. And if you don't draw this distinction, you're going to get confused. So I want to make sure that we think a little bit about what freedom is. Fred, by the way, was a Duke professor um, and started this theory. Okay? Let's think about free coffee. What makes coffee free? You don't have to pay for it. So is that seat free? Yeah, because it's not reserved. Is, do we have free speech in this country? Yeah, if we're not punished for speaking that way. So notice that freedom is always, you have to think of it in a negative way. It's always freedom from some kind of barrier. In the case of coffee, the barrier is cost. In the case of seats, the barrier is a reservation. In the case of speech, the barrier is a punishment. But freedom is always freedom from some kind of barrier. And so the crucial question when you're talking about freedom of action and freedom of will in general is what's the relevant barrier? And I think people have confused two different barriers. One is freedom from causation. And the other is freedom from constraint. So you might be caused to do something, but still you're not constrained in the sense that you get to do exactly what you want to do. Like Bill, he might have been caused to burn his house down, but he got to do what he wanted. He, he made that choice. Okay? So... To get this straight, because it is a confusing distinction, it's confusing partly because many acts are both caused and also constrained. So if someone is in prison, then the bars on their cell cause them to stay in the cell. And they also constrain them so that they can't leave the cell. So it works both ways. Internal constraints also. Take a phobia, like in the bottom right, a phobia of spiders. Someone might want to stay in the room, but they can't. They're caused by their fear to leave the room, and they're constrained from doing what they want, namely to stay in the room, because they just can't deal with it. So sometimes you're caused and constrained, but there's some cases where acts that are caused are not constrained. And here's where I need Jesse's help, because my example is watching a movie just because you want to watch the movie, okay? So we have a little dialogue. Where were you? You promised to drive me to the airport. You never showed up and I missed my flight. You didn't even say you're sorry. I thought you were my friend. Why'd you let me down? Don't be angry with me. 
I watched a movie instead. Oh, great. You watched a movie? What kind of excuse is that? Walter, it's the newest kind, a neural excuse. I really wanted to watch the movie, and my desires are lodged in my brain, so my brain made me do it. Well, of course your brain made you do it. It wasn't your foot. Your, your desires are located in your brain, uh, so your brain made you do it. So what? What matters is which part of your brain made you do it. Uh, and what made you do it was the parts of your brain that constitute your desires. So saying that your brain made you do it is just a fancy way of saying you did it because you wanted to. And that's no excuse. But given all of my desires and beliefs, I would, exa- I would act in the exact same way every time in the same circumstances. Sure, sure. But why? Only because your brain is set up so that you care more about that movie than you care about me. How is that supposed to make me any less angry? Your brain doesn't care about me or you don't care about me. Either way, you treated me like dirt. Walter, I and my brain are sorry. So what's the point of this little dialogue? Uh, The point is to figure out which kind of freedom matters. I want to say that freedom from constraint matters to law and morality. Who should we blame? Should we blame Jesse for not keeping his promise? Well, it sounds like we should, I think. And you think through that example and many other examples, he ought to be blamed because he could have recorded the movie and then come and give a hand done what he promised uh and so uh he is worthy of blame but freedom from causation doesn't matter it doesn't matter to law or to morality and that's also shown by the example because jesse was fully caused by his desire to watch the movie he would have done the same thing in this in the similar circumstances okay but still freedom from causation I'm not saying it doesn't matter at all. It does matter to science. Why did he do that is a question that many scientists want to ask, and they're looking for the cause of the action. It also matters to religion. They might ask, are humans special in a way that makes them separate from the natural world and different from animals and computers? If they don't have a cause, then they are. They're different from animals and computers. Okay? So, I don't think we all have freedom from causation, but we can still have freedom from constraints. So the conclusion that I want to draw is, even if you're determined, like in the initial example, so you can't have, you cannot have free will in the sense of freedom from causation. You are a cause, so you're not free from causation. But you can still have free will in the sense of freedom from constraint. You're not constrained. You're not coerced. You don't have a phobia or a delusion or a compulsion. Uh, Nobody's pushing you. You're not in jail. And that is what matters to law and to morality. And what's supposed to show that is the examples of Bill killing his family with a fire and Jesse not showing up, you know, when I really needed him. So uh, that's all I have time to say. Uh, Now we'll hear the perspectives of psychology and engineering. I don't know if any of you recognize this is a picture from 1967 of Catherine Switzer, who was the first American woman to run the Boston Marathon wearing an official bib. She registered as K. Switzer, and so the race director didn't know that she was a woman until he saw her. She actually trained with boys. She was 19 years old. He looked at her and he ran towards her. And a photographer, back then, not everybody had a cell phone. So this is kind of a remarkable catch by a photographer say, um, who saw him push her off the course. And she, he pushed her to the ground. In a 2017 interview, I listened to her talk about what made her get up and finish the race. And here's what she said. I was determined to finish. I wanted to prove that I could do it and that women everywhere could do it and should be allowed to do it. I realized women just needed opportunities, that they didn't believe in themselves, that they believed in the myths surrounding arduous sports for women, and they were going to be forever limited by their capability. And then she stopped herself and said, no, their belief in their lack of capability, rather, if they didn't have the opportunity to try otherwise. Switzer's words perfectly capture what most psychologists take to be our folk intuitions about free will. They involve intentions, our determination to do it, 
alternative possibilities for action, and like Walter said, constraints on possibility, limits. But they also capture something else which isn't so obvious from most psychological theories, which is the cultural and social significance of her action for other women. And in fact, this became a mission for her in being one of the founders of Title IX and working towards um, equality in sports for women. In my lab, we're interested in the developmental origins of these intuitions that ordinary humans, all of you who raised your hand when Walter asked you questions, um, have about free will. And we're interested in it not just when we're uh, adolescents, young adults, but also when we're babies. So even before babies can tell you what they think of free will, they are always using our actions to interpret what's going on inside our minds. And when they do so, they rely on concepts of intention, alternative possibilities, and constraints. Here's an example for us from a study of 14-month-olds um, Gerge and Chibra and their colleagues ran many years ago. In this study, infants were shown either one of two women. Each time, uh, one group of infants saw her press a panel with her head and turn on a light while her hands were free on the table. Another group of infants also saw her press a panel with her head and turn on a light. But this time, she was wearing a blanket around her and hugging herself so her hands were physically occupied. Infants were given a chance to imitate her actions in both cases, and they did something very different each time. The infants who saw her hands on the table did the entire thing she did. They put their hands on the table and they hit the light with their heads. They reasoned that if she had wanted to do otherwise, she would have. She was free to, and therefore, that she really wanted them to learn not just the end goal, but also the means. And so they did. The infants in the other condition, when her hands were occupied, just looked at the light and touched it with their hands. Here they reasoned, <laughs> these are 14-month-old infants, right? Pretty smart. Here they reasoned that there was a better way to do it, and had she been less limited, less constrained, she would have done it this better way. We have used a similar kind of setup to look at three-year-olds' judgments of moral responsibility based on intent in our lab. So we showed three-year-olds this box, um, and it has a marble run, and the marbles can go in the top, and they can go into either one of two sides in the middle. We showed them that one of the doors was could open up, and if you pressed both levers, the marble would fly out the door. The other door was taped shut, and if you pressed one lever, the marble will get stuck inside. And then we said, these marbles belong to my friend, and she really would be upset if we got them lost inside the box. Then the three-year-olds watched a person do three things. Once, the person pulled both levers and the marble was released from the door. And once, he pulled only one lever and the marble got stuck inside. And the final time, we tied his hands together so that he pulled only one lever and the marble got stuck inside. This time, we looked at how angry and upset the kids got in each of these cases. And what we found was obviously they weren't angry when he was helpful, but they also weren't angry when his hands were tied together. They only got angry and protested his actions when he was free to do otherwise. So if we stop here, the intuitions of young children, even babies, look quite a bit like ours about intention, alternative possibilities, and limits. But there are cases in which young children actually look quite different from us. This is one of those cases. When we ask children if you are free to do something that you don't want to do, or free not to do something that you do want to do, in other words, exercise self-control, children say no. I hopefully have time to show just a little bit of what that looks like with sound. Maybe, maybe not. No sound. He's, um, he's drawing a picture of her favorite food, noodles. He puts the noodles in front of her and says, mom and dad said that's okay to eat it or not eat it. So if you want it, if you really want the noodles and you think they're yummy, can you just choose not to eat them or do you have to eat them? And she says, you have to eat them. And he says, why? And she said, because they're yummy. Since I don't have sound, by the time children are six, they do something a little bit different. Here, this girl likes ice cream, and we asked her if she could choose to eat, to not eat the ice cream, but she really, really loves it, and it's yummy. And she says, 
No, you can choose to eat it. You cannot choose to eat it. It's a choice. So that's one case in which four-year-olds look very different from us, and six-year-olds give a response that you and I would recognize. Another case is when it comes to social limits and moral limits. Young children don't feel that they have moral agency. They think that you have to follow the rules. You have to be good. You have to be fair. You have to be nice. But by the time children are six or seven, they recognize that we follow the rules of our own free will. I could do something that'll hurt somebody's feelings, but I wouldn't want to. So it's nice to know that some things change over the first six years of life, but we wanted to know why those things changed. One of the reasons I study development is because I'm interested in how all of us change and grow throughout our lifespans. So in, this early, in these early years, what's responsible for these changes to our intuitions? So there's a simple answer, right? Is that children between the ages of four and six get better at self-control. They get better at making difficult choices. We help them. We, we, we help them get better through education, through parenting, and through all these things. And they do actually, um, they do actually succeed more often than fail with age. And in our own work, we've found that individual children who are better at self-control also have higher beliefs in free will. And that is at every age across four to nine. But the simple answer is actually not so simple. And this is where I need my notes. And so I'm going to take a minute. So the perception that our actions are free seems immediate to us as adults. It doesn't actually seem as if any cultural bias could insert itself at all. But when cultural psychologists have asked people about choices and whether they're free to choose, they find that while everyone across the world perceives choice somewhere, there is variation in which things we think are choices. In our own work, we found that individual differences in self-control predict free will beliefs only in the U.S., in the samples that we've looked at, both in Ithaca, New York, in California, and now here in North Carolina, where I've recently moved. In China, in Peru, and in Singapore, children have beliefs in free will that look a lot like our Western beliefs. They also get better at self-control. The two are not connected. And we think this is because children in the U.S. interpret their actions through a cultural narrative in which successes and failures of self-control are attributed to successes and failures in will. Studies of the, de of the developing self across cultures show that this cultural narrative is far from universal. So if it's not so simple, and free will beliefs are a product of our own experiences of our actions, but also of cultural learning, then how do these two fit together? A little bit of a hint of an answer comes from what children say when they say they think an action is a choice. They make up stories. So for example, maybe you cannot eat the yummy cookie because you're too full. Or maybe you can be mean to your friend because you don't want him to be your friend anymore. Or maybe you can take all the cookies for yourself if you say that there aren't any cookies today and you are sneaky about it. The explosion of social imagination eventually leads to moments like these where we can dream the impossible and make it real. Thanks. Well, I'm glad to be here. I, uh, I'm going to exercise my free will and sit while I speak. I have no slides, uh, which is unusual for me. I'm used to uh, showing a lots of slides. I was very surprised to get the invitation to be here. Engineers usually don't speak about free will. Uh, 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 maybe not even think about it very much. I know I, I didn't. But Joe's invitation was very, um, very clever. Uh, she, she said, I know you probably don't get many invitations like this. And she was right, of course. But then she said, I got the idea to invite you because I read a story or an article about your, your new book. This was last fall. And my new book is called Force. And force is a big word that applies to just about any discipline. But I meant it as literally 
force. The idea of touching something and pushing it or pulling something or punching somebody and uh, punching you back. These are, these are real forces that we feel and we execute with our, our, our bodies. Now, uh, the force I'm talking about furthermore is not quantum mechanics force, uh, you know, particles in the atom, but, but rather the force that Isaac Newton studied and laid down uh, his three laws of uh, law, force and motion. I'm sure you all know of the laws, but just so we uh, understand the forces I'm talking about, the first law is, of course, the law of inertia that uh, a body, and it's usually expressed as a body, it means a mass or a bunch of matter that's in an identifiable shape. Uh, so a body at rest will remain at rest until acted upon by an external force, something outside it. So a pool ball, for example, on a table will sit there until the cue stick hits it or it hits a, another ball or it hits the cushion and so forth. The uh, second law is usually expressed by the iconic uh, equation F equals MA. This is to engineering, really to physics too, what uh, E equals MC squared is to relativity. And um, it basically connects force and motion. When we hit something with a force, it, it moves. And how it moves depends on what direction the force is in, how large the force is in. And what connects the force and the motion is the mass of the body, how heavy it is. Uh, this is why, for example, on say an interstate highway, a big hill will have a passing lane for large trucks because large trucks are much more massive than automobiles and they're going to therefore accelerate more slowly and climb up the hill more slowly. And the third law is the law of action and reaction. That uh, if I push on something, it pushes back. The Technically, uh, the earth is pulling us, that keeping us in our place. It gives us weight. It keeps us from uh, floating off into space. But at the same time, the mass that we have is uh, exerting a force on earth, on the earth. But it's not nearly as large as what the earth is exerting on us. So we don't move the earth very much. Now, engineers use these all the time. And that's what designs, oh, this structure, for example, uh, because those laws were applied to uh, building this, uh, to laying out how this structure should be built. That's why the ceiling's not coming down upon us, the floor is not falling out from under us, and so forth. And even the why the tables are staying uh, straight as they as they were built and meant to be. So there, you could do an awful lot with uh, with Newton's laws. You don't have to worry about relativity. You don't have to worry about quantum mechanics. And engineers stay within this realm. And my book stays within this this realm also. But uh, it's hard not to acknowledge that the word force is used by all sorts of disciplines in all sorts of ways, and it's part of our common language. Uh, I can force somebody to do something, or somebody can force me to do something. We could put pressure on a group, and so forth. These are all allusions to the concept of force. And they sort of fit nicely into Newton's law, if you want. Sometimes you have to stretch a little bit. But uh, one fellow who, and this, this is where the book uh, departs a little bit from the strictly um, mechanical concept of force. Uh, and, and I mention these things, and I, that might be why um, the, the book has been misinterpreted a little bit in some instances. The uh, British edition, for example, the, sold by the British publisher, uh, categorized it as psychology, which uh, I don't, I didn't mean it, of course. I didn't, I hope I didn't cause it, but who knows. But, uh, so I tell stories. Um, I tell the story of Roger uh, Babson, for example, who was an engineering graduate of MIT. But his real interests were business. And uh, he began to apply Newton's laws to the stock market. 
back in the 1920s. Principally, uh, he tried to uh, apply the third law, the action and reaction principle, to how the market would move up and down by, according to various external forces and internal forces. And he correctly predicted the crash of 1929 in ways that no other financial writer or advisor was, was doing at the time. It made him famous. He got rich writing a newsletter, advising and predicting other things. Now, he went off the deep end, uh, some people, most people would say, when he uh, began to theorize about gravity, and gravity was the big enemy of the people. Uh, he, he, uh, he started a gravity research foundation, and it's still going on. Uh, in which he initially, its purpose was uh, to give a prize for the invention of an anti-gravity machine to outsmart gravity, to outsmart forces. He never got close, so it's evolved that now there's sort of theoretical papers about gravity and physics. Uh, mostly graduate students and postdocs enter the competition. There are other uh, people that... Um, Take force as, let me see uh, how I should say it, motivation or metaphor. Uh, and I discuss these in, in the book along with uh, describing certain paradoxes that occur in the context of force and motion. Uh, one of them is a, a common experience that uh, we don't have ourselves usually, but we see all the time. In the past few years, I've noticed an awful lot of uh, cable laying around Durham. Uh, and so there are a lot of big spools, wooden spools with cable on it, there, hey, uh, cable, TV cable, uh, internet cable, whatever, whatever it is. Sometimes it's not even clear what it is. But how do you get um, the cable off the spool? Here's an object. You got to pull the cable off the roll somehow, off the spool somehow. And, but since you're applying a force to an object, that means it's going to move. Now these things are heavy, and they're big, and they can be dangerous. So what's going to happen if you pull? Of course, we're not going to do it. The workmen are going to do it. That are laying this cable. There are two questions: uh, How can I keep it from moving? And if it does move, how can I get out of the way of it? Uh, this is a question I propose to my uh, students, especially uh, freshman and sophomore students, introductory course in mechanics. And um, they, almost 90% of them, I would say, uh, get it wrong. Even though they know all about Newton's laws, and they've studied it in, in high school, and they probably are taking a physics course here at, at Duke. And it's tricky. And I, I once saw a video of a woman who was a biologist, I believe, involved in pharmacology, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, she was asked a question, and she got it wrong, too, a pretty high-level scientist. So what's going on here? Well, let's imagine this spool, and I'm sure you can all imagine it. It's got a large diameter. And it's got a small diamond. It's like a spool of thread. Or a bobbin would be a closer in proportions. What happens if you pull that? Well, it depends. There's a lot of things depend. If you pull the table off the top, the thing will come toward you. And that's almost easy to see. And just about everybody gets that right. But what happens if you pull the cable from the bottom of the spool. In other words, it's wrapped around, it's coming off the bottom, and you're pulling it. Which way is the spool going to roll? Well, I don't know which way you're saying. <laughs> Toward you or away from you is uh, away. That's what just about every one of the students says. And why they say it, I'm not sure. Uh, whether they're exercising free will, or not, I'm not sure, but they're wrong. And they're, the reason they're wrong is they're not thinking in terms of Newton's law. When you pull it from the bottom, 
you want to spin it the other way. <laughs> it wants to spin the other way. But that's, I mean, that's what people are thinking. But in fact, it's going to roll up on you. It's going to roll back up onto the cable. You can try this very easily with a spool of thread or a spool of a stereo speaker wire or something like that. Because your pull is the same direction as you were pulling before. And force and movement go in the same direction. Now, it gets a little complicated, and I've been told to stop there. I just, I just want to, <laughs> I just want to say one more thing. I just want to say one more thing uh, because uh, I think it's relevant. Uh, other people who have used metaphor are writers and poets. One poet in particular, I think, wrote a wonderful poem that is really getting at this question of free will or not, and it's Dylan Thomas. And he wrote a poem called the force that through the green fuse drives the flower, drives my green age. The force that blasts the roots of trees is my destroyer. And I am dumb to tell the crooked rose. My youth is bent by the same wintry fever. And it goes on with examples. But it's, it's, it's a, almost a perfect poem using force as a metaphor, in this case, for the course of life, from birth to death, the flower to the wintry fever, from spring to winter, and so forth. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Whatever we might think about freedom, we are all subject to Joe's time limits. Uh, Straight. We are all constrained by Joe's time limits. Uh, we'd like to open the floor to questions. Again, uh, there will be questions um, both in person and we'll take questions online. Um, there'll be someone who will ask the question. So if you are uh, joining remotely and want to ask a question that way, someone here will ask it for you. All right. Our first one is from Davia Major. Question for Walter. Is this the same as religious person saying God determines our fate, but we have the free will to decide how to react to God's plan for us? So if God completely determines every aspect of what you do and what happens to you, then you have uh, no freedom from causation because God is causing you. Right. But that doesn't mean you're not constrained because you might still do exactly what you want to do because you want to do it. Uh, just like Jesse not showing up for the appointment and just like Bill killing his wife and family. Uh, if God, God might have caused them to do it, but they can still, we can still say they're not constrained and therefore they are responsible. Are we constrained to be donating a lot of money to Duke? Yes. <laughs> All right. Next question from our virtual audience from Rusty. I'm reminded of the radical behaviorist B.F. Skinner, who believed behavior is shaped and maintained by its consequences and rejected notions of human freedom and dignity. Certainly, environmental consequences influence behavior, but do they completely control it? Always? Yeah, no. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, we are also biological <laughs> organisms who come into this world with some capacities. Um, you know, the, the obvious thing, right? I can't, I'm not free to become a swan. Um, I just am free to become a human being because biologically I'm constrained. I'm caused to become a human being by my genetics. So um, not everything is the environment. Everything is an interaction between our genes and our circumstances or our biology and our environments. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Skinner was smart, but he wasn't right. Yeah. Do you? I agree, except about the part of Skinner being smart. <laughs> you mentioned something um, about kind of the, 
different communities and cultures and how if the highest value is maybe the individual versus the community that impacts behavioral development. Can you explore that further? Obviously, societies like in Singapore where the community is held very high um, and the individual is subservient to the community, maybe that affects development. Can, can you elaborate on that a bit? Um, when it comes to the specific questions that we've explored in our research, um, kids in Singapore um, follow that same j developmental trajectory that four-year-olds tend to say that if you tell them there's a desire, they feel constrained by the desire, and by the time they're a little older, they say no. But one of the things that is different is how they respond to social constraints. So um, my uh, collaborators in Singapore, right, will tell me how authoritarian it is. In fact, my collaborator there is a former student of mine. Um, he is from Shanghai, and he now lives in Singapore, and he's struck even by the difference between China and Singapore in terms of rule following. And um, so in, in the research that we've done, when we ask children in the U.S., whether they're free to break rules, by the time they're six or seven, they say, yeah, you know, I want to be a good kid, but I'm, I can break rules not in Singapore. In Singapore, it's we're not free to break rules all the way up till 10 years old where we've gone in our studies. And why? Well, often it's to save face or because I will be punished or I want to do what everybody else is doing. So they give you all sorts of explanations. Kids in the U.S. and in, in our samples that we've looked at never mention punishment at all. And kids in Singapore do so at rates that are striking. So we're learning a lot about the actual consequences of our actions from the environments that we grow up in. Yeah. yeah. All right, I have a question from Marilyn. If people have free will, to what extent do genes affect it? Example, why do twins separated at birth wind up with so many non-physical similarities, choice of careers, spouses, children's names, et cetera? Jesse, do you want to do one of these? No. <laughs> Like it's hot, it's hot. I think I think the answer is because, as Tamara said, genes and environment interact. It's not one or the other. If anybody ever asks you, well, is it nature or is it nurture? You should always answer both. Uh, and and so the genes, you know, will not lend lead them to exactly the same life for identical twins uh, because the environment also plays a role. If you want, you can come and take Psych 103 with me, and we can talk all about that. So we go through examples. Um, I, um, I several t a decade, fifteen years ago, when I started teaching intro introduction to developmental psychology, the epigenome hadn't entered into psychology, so we didn't know a lot about epigenetics. But now it's in our textbooks, and so I do teach epigenetics when I talk about gene environment interactions. So that's something to look into if you're interested in answers to that question. All right, I got another one from the virtual audience. From James, can it be dangerous to think free will isn't as free as we might think it when it comes to decision making? It seems important to continue to discuss why we make virtuous decisions even without free will. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. Could, could, could you repeat? Sorry. Sure. I'm start again. Can it be dangerous to think free will isn't as free as we might think it when it comes to decision making? Oh, yeah. So it can be dangerous to think that you don't have free will, right? Because they've done studies and when people are manipulated so as to have less belief in free will, they're more likely to, for example, put hot sauce on the little cracker that they're giving to the person that doesn't like hot sauce. Uh, they're more likely to misbehave in that and other ways. Uh, some of those studies have not been replicated, but there's a suggestion then that if you don't believe in free will, you're going to think, well, it's not my fault if I misbehave. On the other hand, if you believe too much in free will and forget that sometimes people really are constrained, you're going to be too quick to jump on the punishment bandwagon and punish people and blame them for things that they really uh, don't deserve punishment and blame for. So it's one of those things where you can have, you know, too much in either direction. You can think, you know, too much belief in free will, too much denial of free will. They both cause problems. You got to get it just right. All right. Rusty has a follow-up question somewhere on that Skinner one. 
How would a no free will abolitionist such as Skinner or others explain altruistic behavior, for example, self-sacrifice as when a soldier in combat falls on a grenade to protect the lives of his or her companions? This soldier is choosing self-annihilation. Where's the reward? What? Dude, I'm not going to defend Skinner here. Um, One of the problems with behaviorism is that the question of what is reinforcing to human beings, what is a reward for a human being, never received a proper answer. I was taught, that's what I was taught when I was a psych major a long time ago. Um, And that a cognitivist perspective ended up taking over because we got stuck. Um, Of course, now we know that it is incredibly rewarding to do good things for others. It gives us all sorts of benefits. And so that, I think that situation that you're talking about um, is perfectly well explained, even by Skinner, dare I say it, if he understands the reward of kindness to the self. And so much about what we do when we do good for others actually ends up just having benefits for us. Now, if somebody now asks me if there is such a thing as true altruism, given the fact that we're always getting rewarded for being good um, to others, uh, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to let one of the philosophers do it. So so I I completely agree, but I want to add there might be some cases where you don't get any reward to yourself because you jump on a grenade to save your buddies, and then you're not around anymore to get any reward. There, I think, you know, Skinner could still explain it by saying, well, you built up a habit. You built up a habit of taking risks for your buddies and of doing things to save your buddies, uh, and then you're acting out of habit. Uh, And that habit might have arisen for many cases in the past when you did things to help your buddies, and you did get rewarded. But those habits can continue even in situations where you don't get rewarded. And at those moments, you're acting altruistically. I have a question for Professor Petrovsky. Um, when you were listening to to Walter share about causation and constraints, how do you see that uh, translating over into the concepts that you teach in engineering and that you shared in your book on force? Well, it, it depends on on how uh, deep and advanced we want to go, but uh, it's it's generally one of the things you mentioned was very interesting about how everything that happened before uh, influences what is happening now. Uh, this is a concept that in mechanics and engineering and force concept was expressed in the early 19th century by Laplace. And uh, basically, uh, he said, if we know, or if an intellect knows, um, and he didn't name the intellect, uh, the position of every particle, every piece of matter in the universe, and knows the forces that are acting uh, between those particles, then uh, he would know, exact, that person, that, that intellect would know from whence everything came, would tell all the past history back to the creation of the universe, and would know everything in the future, which would then say, you know, no, basically, uh, nothing's going to change other than how it's determined to change. Now, that these uh, inanimate objects are not people. Uh, when when I read something like that, I think in terms of more concrete uh, stuff. And uh, I was thinking, well, what if all these particles are like uh, bumper cars at a at a state fair? Now uh, there. The particles are not uh, going to just react uh, to what what bumps into them. The person in the bumper car is going to have something to say w- about that, and presumably that if that person has free will, and well, then that person can steer left or right in anticipation of being hit and so forth. But but we all know that if you're in a bumper car and somebody comes from behind, you can't anticipate that. It takes you by surprise. So uh, in that case, it's probably very unlikely that um, you know uh, you could predict the future very far, even you know microseconds uh, in the future. So when it comes to thinking in terms of force and thinking in terms of metaphorical force, um, it it is uh, less clear to me. Uh, and uh, you know, to to be honest, I hadn't thought about. It these matters uh, before I got this invitation. 
and I hadn't thought much about them until I was re reminded last week that I'm supposed to be here tonight. No, it's not the only thing I do. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but but yeah, does that does that respond to your question? Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Jesse, we have one more question. Um, what would you like to ask the panelists? I, I, <clears throat> I have a question about whether you think it is possible for us to believe that we are unfree, regardless of whether it's true. Do you think it's possible for us to believe entirely that we are unfree? Define however you want. You want to go first? I mean, I don't care. But I mean, I, w I would insist on the, right. I would insist on the distinction I drew between freedom from causation and freedom from constraint. I think it's certainly possible for us to think that we are always unfree from causation; that we're always caused. I mean, I I believe that, uh, but I might not be thinking about it when I make a decision. But if you ask me, I'll go, yeah, I believe that. I would assert it, uh, even if I'm not thinking about it at, at every moment of my life. Can I think that I am always constrained and never responsible? I think that's very difficult because if I think I'm always constrained and never responsible for what I do, then does my wife really love me or does she just stay with me because she's forced to? Uh, you know, your relations to other people are going to be so different. I think your life would just be turned around if you gave up on that notion of responsibility. Uh, and so I think it would be very difficult for anyone to ever th really think uh, that they are not uh, free from constraint in some circumstances. So can I turn the question a little? Because I liked Walter's answer fine. One of the issues, it was fine, it was great. One of the, I want to go back to the thing you said before. One of the issues is that in it's very, very common that we blame other people, their internal characters, for things that they've done wrong, but we don't hold ourselves responsible for things that we've done wrong. One of the hardest things in the world, it elicits often a lot of emotion, shame being one of the dominant ones and guilt um, to even admit that you've done something wrong, to even say you're sorry to someone else. Um, and I th do think it's possible for us to see our own flaws. And I do think it's possible for us to see that other people are maybe not always acting from theirs. And that's part of the work that we do, not, um, not just uh, at age seven, but all the way th through our lives. So. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm getting out of my field if I got in. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Jesse, for moderating. And Henry and Tamar and Walter, thank you for sharing your expertise with us and your foresight into what is free will.